Hi there, I'm Chris Chapwanya, and welcome to another webinar being brought to you by Oil Now. Um, this edition will be focusing on local content. We have been taking a closer look over the last couple of weeks on the Gas to Power project, as you would have seen. Um, we're going to delve a bit more today into the local content uh, framework that has been developed and that has been consulted on. Um, as you know, the government of Guyana is forging ahead with consultations to establish that policy. Um, it's likely to lead to legislation and feedback from key stakeholders in the business community and other interest groups um, on this revised draft have been ongoing um, for the last several weeks. And particular interest we've seen um, in the areas of the slide and scale targets set out in the draft, we're going to hear a lot about that. Um, the proposed regulatory framework and the imp implementation strategy and role of key stakeholders related to this. Um, joining us in this discussion today, we have a very great panel. Um, Natasha Gaskin-Peters is the director at the Center for Local Business Development. Timothy Tucker, he's, the, he's a business operator, a member of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce, recently served as the vice president for the chamber. Um, incidentally, the chamber just less than 24 hours ago had their annual general meeting, their 131st annual general meeting where they would have elected a new council and that council within a week's time uh, would move to elect a, a new president. Um, congratulations, Timothy. I've seen that you're on that new council. Um, I believe you've received the highest vote so far. Um, and usually um, that is an indicator of who may well take up the leadership. I'm not saying anything, you know, we have to wait to see. Um, Marnie Dahl, <laughs> and we also have with us Marnie Dahl. Marnie Dahl is a former director at Statsoli Hydrocarbon Institute. Um, Statsoli is Suriname State Oil Company. Um, Suriname would have been producing oil since the 1980s onshore. Um, we are hearing a lot more about them now because of the offshore activities and excitement that is happening there, similar to what would have happened here in Guyana back in 2015 with that first Lisa discovery. So uh, with that, I'd like to welcome you all and, and, and you know, just ask, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Doing great, Chris. Thanks for asking. Very good, Chris. Thank you for having me. Great. So, you know, let's start off this discussion because while some may think this is an obvious thing, I believe a lot of people are still not too clear on what really is local content. You know, when we talk about local content, what exactly do we mean? Um, I'll ask you, Tim, first to, 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 to go with that because you two have been not just recently, um, but as a member of the chamber, the chamber itself would have been speaking extensively on local content as far back as 2015. Um, so when we talk about local content, particularly in the context of, of, of business and local capacity, what exactly do we mean or should we mean? I think that, um, and again, thanks for having me. I think that the fundamental of local content uh, from the business community is all participation and, the, and members of the Guyanese public participation in the newfound wealth, in the discovery. I mean, we're looking at everything from your... Um, upstream, midstream, downstream, you know, all the different components of the oil and gas industry may it be um, from the labor capacity, from the supplier capacity, but it is by definition, right, Guyanese input into the sector. Um, and the chamber has been from day one, um, pushing for more participation because we believe that it is an opportunity for us as a business community to learn a new concept, a new business, a new expertise. It's a glorious opportunity for us to raise our standards, to take our businesses to an international level. Um, and of course, we know that the oil and gas industry is one of the most capital intense industries in the world. So, of course, um, majority of business people getting to business to make money. So fundamentally, um, from the business standpoint, it's us looking to capitalize on it from a local perspective, because we know that 
if there is no strong local content and the development of capacity in country, you will have to get people to come in and do it. Um, and we believe that those of us who've been here, um, like my father who never migrated and my, myself and my brothers, we look that, you know, we always, it's a Guyanese dream that one day we knew something, either they would have found El Dorado in the jungle <laughs> or something would have come about. Something was, something was always destined for this land and every single person knew it and we waited and we waited and it's here. And we really think that we should be part, right? After waiting so long and having trust and faith in the leaders before us who came and, and left us, that now we should play an integral part in developing those natural resources and not doing it in a, a lower capacity, but, that, but nothing but the best and developing that in turn. So I hope that I didn't go off the topic too much and, and uh, that answered your question. We've always had the yellow gold. You spoke about El Dorado. I think it's the black gold now that um, we're, we're even more um, excited about in, in, in some ways. Um, I want to bring in Marnie here and then go to Natasha because uh, there's an interesting perspective um, uh, Marnie can share with us. Um, being a former director of the Statsoli Hydrocarbon Institute, that entity, um, which is part of Statsoli uh, uh, as a whole, um, has been playing an integral role in negotiating with oil companies, international oil companies in particular, um, coming into Suriname to, to, to explore and produce hydrocarbon resources. Um, and Marnie, in, in, in the, the, the many, many discussions that you've had over the years with oil companies coming into Suriname, um, is, is their understanding of local content usually in sync with the host country? Well, um, thank you um, again for, for having me. Uh, and I'm, I have to applaud uh, Guyana and the government and of course all important stakeholders that, um, that you have this discussion. Because um, it's, it's, if you're talking about natural resources, then all of a sudden sovereignty is, is, is very important because at the end of the day, it's the people that own the resources. Not only us who live here in 2021, but also our children and our grandchildren. And I always say, who are we to use all the water, all the energy? And the same goes for uh, the, 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 the wood that we, that we both have, um, or the crude oil for that matter. So um, it is important and not everybody will agree with all policies, but have that discussion. Because at the end of the day, if you have a policy in place that you made, it's gonna be uh, the people of Guyana that, that will uh, be in a position to see when and how to adjust policies to cater for the world we're, we're living in. So I, I really have to applaud the, the Guyana, Guyana. Coming back to um, your, your question, um, how in sync are we? I think uh, one of the biggest challenges I had in my former position was managing expectations. And um, of course, these multinationals and our initial discussions were with the nimble independents who had a track record in, in among others, West Africa that we attracted to the, um, to the basin. Um, at least the part uh, that, that's, that straddles over Suriname, because we saw that uh, what they were doing there. And normally the smaller independents are, I would say, easier to approach. You're dealing directly with the owners or directors, and you're not part of a very big, big, big organization, like um, you're very familiar with Exxon. Um, that is... They've done this for uh, more than a hundred years, so they, they know. And um, they all want, of course, because they know it's sensitive, because people are involved. Uh, it's a natural resources that we own, the people own. They know it's important that you have a good relationship with the people, meaning the business society, and of course, those who, who just wanna have a job, 
just to want to have a job. Um, and um, in my my dealings on the other side has to do with Suriname is smaller than Guyana. We're a little village. We have, I would like to say we have about half a million people, uh, but sometimes I wonder. And basically Paramaribo, the capital has about 280,000 people. So everybody knows everybody. The family lines go all over the place. And you can imagine that as soon as people hear about discoveries and they know things are happening offshore, they wanna be part of it. So some of them approached us and said, Marnie, I have a chicken farm. I have about a hundred chickens and I wanna be a supplying breakfast offshore. So, um, and it's genuine ask questions and genuine concerns. So when we, <laughs> We were called up in church uh, at, the, at the pool. We decided that it would be a good idea to have a baseline study. And that's what we did in 2018, before any discovery, trying to make the people understand two things. How prepared are we as business society? And the second is, second thing we did is, how do, how do we, how does our, our, our um, technical schools, how do they, are they preparing people that could um, become uh, an employer in, in, uh, in, in the oil and gas sector? So um, I would not say it was in sync because on the one hand you have these international companies that have done it before. And then you have people from a very small nation um, that want to be part of it. So I wouldn't say that we were in sync, are in sync yet. Okay, I've seen that baseline study too, um, which you refer to. And I, I, I've noticed also a lot of similarities between um, what that baseline study said, um, where Suriname is and needs to be, and where Guyana is and needs to be. Um, Natasha, you have extensive interactions with businesses here in Guyana. Well over 2,700 local companies are on this supplier portal. And you interact with them every day um, and deal specifically um, with local participation in the oil and gas industry. Um, in terms of a definition of what constitutes local content and some of the feedback that you are getting from the business community, um, how would you comment on that? First, when we think about local content with any resource fund, you know, local content becomes important. But of course, defining local content is something else. So we can think of spend with local companies. We can think about employment of our local people. So as Guyanese, we want to ensure that we benefit from the industry, as Timothy mentioned. However, as we think of true local content, we also have to focus on the economic definition. So we have to think about leakages within our economy. And so I may have spend with a local company, but if that local company is importing supplies, then that becomes a leakage. And so that has to be taken out of spend before I can get to true local content. So as Guyanese, as we think about local content, when we remit profits abroad, so if I'm a local company and I'm not reinvesting my profits in country, then again, it becomes a leakage. So we want to ensure that as we spend a local company, as we focus on local workforce, that that money is kept in our economy and reinvested because that is what is going to foster economic growth in country. And so this is the message that we are driving home to our local suppliers. This is why, you know, um, ExxonMobil and, and its partners prior to final investment decision of the Lisa field decided they, they made that decision to invest in local content in country. Of course, local content is good for business also. They want to be competitive internationally. So sourcing the supplies in country, it can become cheaper. And so a lot of the operations also have moved in country. We heard at our supplier forum, SIPEM, for example, has recently put together their fabrication yard in Guyana. 
you know, we, there's the shore base facility that we have in country and there's a tender out for another shore base. Um, so we are seeing things moving in country, but even within in country, as we think about the spend on companies, local companies, and the spend on our workforce, you know, as businesses and as Guyanese people, we also have to think about leakages. And so we want to ensure that that spend is not only not focused on pass through items. So sort of a wholesale retailing and, and just a little bit of markup. But we want to ensure that we also invest in things that are fabricated in country that are made in Guyana so that, you know, our resources can remain in country, which is the true definition of, of local content. You, you touched on leakages, Natasha, and um, Timothy, this is, this is coming back to, to, to part of what you said recently, um, that local content should not um, just be about window dressing and the appearance of Chinese companies benefiting from the industry um, when they're not benefiting um, in actuality. What did you really mean by window dressing? And we've had so far three versions of this local content policy. Um, and, and, and this is the revised third version, I believe, that we've had so far done, moving towards now something that is, is, is final. Um, so two questions here, Timothy. Explain the window dressing um, comment that you recently made. And from the initial policy that was drafted here in Guyana to what you and the chamber would have been re reviewing and commenting on recently, um, have you been able to see any uh, difference across those three policies that speak to some of the concerns that the chamber has, such as um, local companies just being added um, there for window dressings in partnerships with, with, with external companies? The chamber has been one that has been in the forefront of um, promoting partnerships because, like Natasha would have said just now, we realize that there are lots of things that we would have to import. A lot of our members are importers. We have a lot of manufacturers too, but we all know that the cost of manufacturing in Guyana makes us uncompetitive. Um, we could produce the best aluminum in the world, but the cost of smelt to put in an aluminum smelting factory, it would not be feasible. So hence, the, that's the reason why we are not able to have a lot of things in-house, but the importers, all of them pay a lot of taxes. Those are the people that drive the economy, employ a lot of people. So a great portion of their money is left in the country, even though they're importing. Um, and you can check that with some of the major man, um, importers into the country. You could look at National Hardware, Garfour, Stosi Passad, David Passad Investments, and you can go through the whole link, link of them. Um, who do our steel stockists, our different things. So they, by themselves, the amount of people and families and the multiplying effect that those businesses have done over the years, the contributions to this economy, to the Guyana economy over the years is, you know, it's huge. Um, even though you can consider those businesses to be leakages, right? But a good portion is captured compared to people who now just set up shops. So they just... So this is where my um, storefront comes into place, play because you're going to have Timothy Tucker in a small office somewhere saying that I have a, a, a big warehouse, a big um, producing steel, and I can give you steel at next to nothing. And you said, okay, fine, the steel qualifies to the oil and gas industry. I, I'm considered a, um, a local business because I'm Guyanese, I'm 51% owned. And I present a quotation. You said, good, let me get a sample of the steel. I give you a sample of the steel. And you said, okay, good, give me $100 million worth of steel. But I you know I'm not really the holder of the steel. There's, my partner is the real holder of the steel. And none of the decisions on what they manufacture, none of the decisions on, none of the steel is actually stored in Guyana, warehoused in Guyana. 90% um, of the office staff um, are overseas. And then I have a MOU with that company that says that company has um, 
my voting rights, right? On the on so my voting rights are I, I in my MOU I signed my voting rights over to the, my forty something percent partner. I agree that I will give him um, ninety five percent of the profits. And I will collect a salary and I will collect 5% of the profits. Now, um, just to have a storefront, I have to do nothing. I just have to go and shake a few hands and say, and say that the company is Guyanese, right? That is window dressing. And that, we have been seeing that already. We have seen that um, huge in many sectors. Um, it's, it's there in multiple sectors. It's there in the oil and gas industry where it's not as rampant, I wouldn't say, you know, it's there are the odd cases of it, but that fundamentally, I have had um, people send me agreements that when I read the fine print to, to do partnerships, let's say that I have to give them my voting rights, right? So, and those are companies that, are, that track that, and there are lots of people that go through that, that don't read, that don't take the time to say, let's, let's Let's, let's take this to a lawyer. You know, they're happy that, oh, they're getting a big partner. They sign the MOU and they already don't read the MOU. So, you know, those are the things that we generally have to be careful of and we're not being used or present ourselves as window dressing. Uh, and that's hence the topic, the, the question that, um, to answer that question and the reason behind the comment of window dressing. Um, and rent a citizen. Some of these things definitely um, would and should be addressed in a policy or legislation. There are some other aspects of it, though, as, as, as you explained, um, where businesses themselves would have to take personal responsibility in terms of understanding um, the agreements that they get into. I'm, I'm seeing here in the policy, it defines foreign owned, not registered in Guyana to mean um, any existing or potential supplier or subcontract a company that has less than 51% of its share capital um, owned by Guyanese. Um, so you may well have a situation in which a Guyanese company um, has maybe 50 or 51%. Um, and would that, in your view, answer some of the questions that you have and constitute local participation? Or um, would it also entail where this company is headquartered? Where is it operating from? Where is it paying taxes? It, it needs to be, we, we have said to the Ministry of Natural Resources that they need to strengthen that definition. It, it needs to, I mean, we have, and then it also has to go back to um, 8901, which is the Corporations Act, where that needs to be strengthened in terms of what constitute, what, how you register the business in Guyana, where is your registered office? When a registered office is in Guyana, where your board meetings are to be held, what uh, percentage of your profit must stay in country? And Natasha alluded to some things along those lines where people taking money out of the country, even Guyanese taking the money out of the country to invest it somewhere else. So the definition, and we need to have in that policy a, a test of locality, right? Where the government can look and, and see, listen, these are the players. Exxon has released um, how many companies, local companies, have benefited from them via ripple effects or direct tier one, tier two, and how much local content that they have uh, spending they have done. The government can put in, if you have an, a local content commission, the local content commission would be a secretariat that is tasked with doing that 24 hours a day. Right, 365 days a year where they look at all the businesses doing businesses and make sure that we are not being hoodwinked in, the, in this country, that we are indeed having true local content because it makes no sense that we're trying to force local content and not being really benefiting it. The purpose of local content is for we Guyanese to benefit from it. It's so the money can be, can be uh, netted and, kept, and catched here. Marnie, the baseline study that was done um, in Suriname relating to local capacity, where the um, business community is as against where they, they need to be, um, spoke a lot about the need for businesses in Suriname to build capacity, um, to, to align themselves and to prepare themselves 
um, to be able to effectively offer um, services to the oil and gas industry. Um, listening to some of, 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 of what is happening here in Guyana, um, how has Suriname been able to deal with that? And first of all, I would ask you if Suriname has a local content policy now in place or is in the process of putting one in place like Guyana. Okay, um, first of all, um, there is not from the government a local policy in place. Um, that's, that's not there. Uh, the last, there was a um, seminar two weeks ago, I think, where the Minister of, Net, of Natural Resources spoke um, um, in Suriname. Yes, it was on the 4th of March, and there is, there is one in the making. Um, within stats only, of course, based on the, the pr production sharing contracts we signed, there is a policy, um, more a rollout of how do we want to uh, organize the, the local businesses and how do we uh, stimulate that um, local um, locals are employed in the industry. Um, I, 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 I read the... Um, draft policy. And I, I just briefly want to also comment on um, what uh, Timothy just, just said. Huh? There is a strong focus on international companies. Um, I think it's important that if you look at countries like Suriname and Guyana, um, it, it's, it's, it's quite challenging. We have small local companies and um, with weak management uh, systems, they have financial struggles, and also training of employees is is, is sometimes seen as a burden. Um, so I think that's one of the things we should um, be more aware of. If we join forces as local companies, then we will be much stronger. Another thing that, that uh, I, would, I would like to comment on, if you're um, talking about partnership, partnership is like a marriage almost. Be careful uh, who your partner is because it's, we think money is a quick, financing is a quick fix, but not, that's, not the, that's most of the time not the case. I think that what I've seen in the past 30 years is that if you're selecting a partner, the same goes for selecting a partner to operate, to explore and develop in your country for oil and gas. The, the, the culture needs to be um, very close because if you have a, if a partner is, if you're a real partner, because I think that's what the Guyanese government is looking for. And also what Timothy said, the business society is looking for. And it's, it, it's, it's, you, you want a partner that is at least equal on an equal footage, because if they're too big, um, it's quite difficult to develop a partnership because they, they will run away with you. In the oil industry, you, you also see that um, small independent like Tulu or Hess, if they partner with Total, Shell, Exxon, they, the, 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 the majors have big pockets. They can run, they can, this, they can at the beginning of the, the campaign say, well, I think we need 10 wells to, to, the, to, to explore or appraise a certain um, play. And you say yes to 10, but all of a sudden it's 15. And then you as a smaller company get into a big problem. The same goes for partnering if you, if you aspire to uh, become a, a service provider in the industry. And the last comment I would like to make is that um, um, why, is, why is the government important in this, this whole, I would call it almost a beast that we call local content. It is so big. It's like an elephant that we have to chop up. Um, it's like it's like a simple. I like to give simple examples. I like to break down break down things to simple thing. It's like a market. You 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 live in a village and there is a village master or what have you, and we have every Wednesday a market. It's not because you're big that you have the big the best place in the marketplace. Everybody needs a good 
share. Everybody needs to have at least um, have a, a fair chance, I would say, so that not the big ones just come and bully you out. And um, the, say, the, same, the same way I see the role of government in this whole stimulating that local businesses have um, become partners, just like we had in the long, long, long ago, uh, we had um, agricultural corporations, small farmers working together, the same for the oil industry. We're small, let's not forget that. And let's join, because if we join forces, then we have a better position um, towards the bigger ones, the international renowned one, because they probably don't want us. And I like the word window dressing that was just uh, mentioned. So we have to be, we're not strongest, so we have to be smarter um, and a little bit thinking, thinking ahead of the pack. Because I'm prepared, focus. What do I want actually? Because I'm not gonna be in a position to do everything. We have 700,000 people in Guyana, maybe 600 in Suriname. We're not Nigeria. We don't have a hundred million people. So I think we need to be more practical. And from a government standpoint, their role is not to hand out money, but to help organize that it's not a cat fight. And that's why they're important. And then leave it to business society, leave it to business people to do their thing because that's what they do best. And don't go and mess things up, I would almost say with politics. So there, there, there's two aspects of, of this. Um, Tim, Timothy, you're, you're, you're gonna jump in in, in, in one minute. Um, it's the, first of all, we're speaking about the need to protect local companies and to ensure that they're able to benefit fairly. Um, and then there is the other concern of capacity. Um, and I would like us to touch on that a bit. Timothy, um, I, I know you wanted to um, jump in there, so please go right ahead. What, what I just wanted to say, I, I completely agree. I mean, partnerships is not partnerships. I think the percentage of, partner, of successful partnerships are very low. Um, but in the building of local capacity, partnerships are important because the, the time it will take us, the oil and gas industry is over 100 years old, right? Most of us I mean, in these countries, we don't even know if... Um, fossil fuels have 100 years left in their cycle. So the, the, the quickest way for us to get from where we are to where we want to be would be through partnerships. It's the fastest way to build capacity, it's the fastest way to transfer knowledge, and the quickest way for technological gains, right? Because these companies, some of these companies have oper been operating for a long time, and they know the sector, Guyana, it's, I mean, Suriname, you had onshore. At least you had something. We absolutely are in the wilderness when it comes to this. So it's important, right? Um, partnerships may not be the best thing, but it is the quickest way. If not, we would generically have to do it. We would have to, like, searching in the dark is like going in the jungle and trying to find El Dorado, like what we've been doing all the time. No. You have to build capacity, and it isn't local content cannot be a single source. It, 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 it has to be broad. It has to be, it has to speak, right? Not just about getting keeping money and giving Guyanese jobs and these sort of things, but it has to speak about building capacity, right? It has to speak about strengthening the institutions that, that can teach our people and teach them quickly. We are six years too late for half of the institutions that should have been. From the time this country figured out that it had oil, it should have been strengthening um, the University of Guyana. It should have been strengthening TVET. It should have been strengthening um, GTI, right, into the oil and gas industry. It should have been pushing more emphasis. It should have, we should have had, our university should have been partnering with with universities overseas, it should have, like what the Center of Local Business Development just did, partner with API, that's what should have been done. 
half of us who are operating in local businesses, yeah, as as the Marin would said had said just now, you know, the, the person, the chicken farm is coming to say we would like to supply um, chickens offshore. They don't understand that you have to have certification. They don't understand that you have to get all these kind of certificates. And that is the problem. A lot of us don't know the level of certifications, the required um, analysis and things that we would have to get in order to supply these fields. And some of the companies that we want to partner with already know. They knew from the time we hit oil what we would need in the next 10 years. And the thing is, as we all know, exploration, right, up to production, you know, the, the, the surveying and the drilling of the wells are, is where the real money is spent. After that, it's just pumping the oil and selling it. And that is where it, it kind of, it, the curve kind of dips down, right? The real spending is now, and for us to capture that spending, we need local content. We need local capacity building, and it really needs to be sent we need another university, right? And we need our Guyanese businesses. We need a strong business community because the Guyanese businesses, as you rightfully said, the businessmen don't quite, are not as sharp as the businessmen in the oil and gas industry. And we need to be sharp. Our companies, and Chris, I know I'm going on a little long, I'll stop just now, but um, something that is very important that really speaks to local content is for our local companies, when we partner and create these magnificent relationships, that we take our companies public and really have the Guyanese people involved in our companies and get that money out into the public. So going public, I know a lot of the old businessmen may not like that, but it's time to raise cheap financing. Mm -hmm. It's done via offerings. Yeah, um, Timothy, you, you would have noticed that I chuckled there um, when you mentioned going public. Um, and I think it was at the Chamber's um, AGM yesterday in the President's message. And this is something that the President has been saying for quite some time. Um, and, and that is the need for a change in our business culture too here in Guyana and the way we operate. Um, businesses are often very secretive in terms of how they operate and the very prospect or thought of going public um, is not, uh, you know, widely or broadly necessarily well received, but definitely that is direction the, the, the direction that we need to go in. I want us to talk about capacity and um, because this is a key issue. And if we're speaking about local companies being able to play a meaningful role in their partnership with, with these international companies, then it also means that we too have to, we have to have and continue to build capacity. And I think that local companies do have to demonstrate um, a, a, a willingness to be innovative, a willingness to, to, to think outside of the box. Um, and Natasha, CLBD has facilitated many local companies in terms of getting some of the certification, which Timothy would have mentioned, building capacity in other areas. Tell us a bit about what is being done in the area of building capacity for local companies. So as, as you are aware, Chris, you know, at, at the center, our mandate is to build the competitiveness of, of local Guyanese companies because we want to ensure that they benefit from this particular resource. So we spoke about workforce, we spoke about suppliers, and our focus up is on the supplier aspect. And so at the center, you know, Marnie mentioned the analysis that they did in country. We also did an analysis back in 2017 to really understand what was in country and what can be targeted towards the oil and gas industry. Back then there was very limited capacity in terms of meeting those standards. And so, you know, the industry of course is new, knowledge on the industry as Timothy said, it just wasn't there. So we started with basic training to get person to understand the industry well. We started with the health and safety program. We started with the procurement for oil and gas, the fact that, you know, payment comes after the contract or for larger contract, it may come in milestones. 
We also did the offshore oil and gas. So what technology is used? What is local content? What are the terminologies utilized in the industry? And so persons started to recognize what the needs of the industry are. In that gap analysis, we found that companies had good practices, but documentation of those business practices were absent. So your standard operating procedures, manuals re relating to health and safety just was not there. And so we embarked to supplement this. You know, we did the business courses to teach them good human resource system because we had a lot of businesses that were hiring family members. So in Guyana, we have a lot of businesses that are very family oriented. So how do you manage HR, hire expertise within your company? How do you ensure that you keep proper records? Because the industry will look at your accounting records and also supply chain management. How do you manage this? So this was something totally new to a lot of companies. And then we embarked on the ISO 9001, teaching those those companies how to document and how to implement. Of course, that is an international qualification, you know, from a third party institution. And so to date, we have 14 companies that have completed that ISO program and are now internationally qualified. Nine of those have gone on to gain certification. And Timothy would have mentioned our recent MOU with API, so moving companies even further, so focusing on the manufacturing and, and services company to get them that international certification. And also, you know, the fact that uh, risks are inherent in the industry. So how do we ensure that we really manage and mitigate? We can't eliminate all risks, but how do we mitigate those risks? And so we started the health and safety program. All of these programs are free to Guyanese companies. I must say that at the center, we have seen local companies invest in their companies. We have seen them invest in their workers. They're sending their workers for training. They are, you know, putting, even though it's free from our part, they are putting in the resource and they are winning work. We have local companies now that are working offshore. Some are in partnership. Timothy spoke to partnerships. You know, one of the things that we encourage here at the center is smart partnerships. So if a company is going to come in and, you know, they want to partner with you, you have to do your own due diligence also. Go and visit that company, see what they're doing. They've bought a plane ticket to come to your country. You go and visit them, see their operation. You know, some of key things you may be looking for in, in the, those individuals, such as integrity, good business practices, before you decide to go into a partnership. You know, are they going to transfer skills? Are they going to help to build capacity within your company and, and your lo local workforce? Are they going to transfer technology over time? So what's the longer term plan? So it's not only about a company coming in and, you know, they have the know-how, but you also have to do your own investigation. I mean, the internet is available to all of us now. So go online, do your research, buy a ticket, go visit those entities. You know, the center is here to support. So you can come to us if you're seeking guidance as, as it relates to those partnerships and we will offer our assistance. So again, it's all about, you know, building local companies. We are aware that it's going to take some time, but we have seen tremendous progress from 2017 to 2019 when we did that baseline. As I said, we didn't expect that local entities would be working offshore, but they've done it. And so that is something that uh, we should, should also be very proud of that as a nation, we have made that step in, in a very quick manner, I, I would say. I think we would agree across the board that local content is, is integral to the development of the host country itself. And um, we all support the development of a local content framework. Um, we must, however, look at how best this could be implemented. Um, is there a risk, and this is an open question to all of you, is there a risk of trying to do too much too soon? And when I say that, I, I refer to some of the proposed targets that are in the current revised version of the local content um, policy. Um, the targets indicate what 
percentage of local capacity should 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 um, be activated from the start of operations, and it goes up to about ten years after then. Um, for some of the targets, of course, um, I believe it should be a given. Like for example, management staff, supervisory staff, and so on. Um, that starts from about ten percent and goes up to one hundred percent for unskilled labor. Meaning that from the minute that you start in the area of unskilled labor and semi-skilled labor, labor, the company should have between 50 and 100% local capacity. When we get into some of the more technical aspects of um, the operations and the services that are being offered, um, for example, um, feed, which is the front end engineering and design aspect of the floating production storage and offloading vessels offshore, um, it starts at 20% and it, it goes up to 90% local capacity in about 10 years. Some of this, however, also deals with um, Guyanese at the beginning um, having a key role in terms of, of, of the construction and establishment of these um, massive units that are offshore. Um, there was, of course, some reference in the policy itself too as it relates to supply of materials such as steel which we're not yet manufacturing here in Guyana. Um, and then we've seen reports uh, about how countries such as Brazil and elsewhere would have had to, at some point in time, roll back a bit um, their, their, their policy, um, the, the, the stringent nature of their policy, since um, at the time, it did not really provide for local participation because the capacity was not there. And that kind of interfered with the rate of development um, an investment. So l l let, me, um, let me ask you first, Timothy, and then Marnie, who would have been negotiating with these international companies. Um, how do you find that balance? And is there a concern for a country like Guyana and Suriname that is now building capacity, both at the same time in the offshore, um, of trying to have too much done at home too soon? It's simple. The policy is there as guidance. It's policy. It's not legislation as yet. So I'm sure it's going to be a working document. It's going to, they're in the same document. There's a, it speaks to setting up of a local content commission, of course, that would monitor the, the, the effects and the tariffs and everything. And I believe that you, what we have not realized, and as Natasha just alluded to, there are Guyanese working offshore already. So a lot of these targets are set for countries that are now developing an, an oil and gas sector. Guyana is already six, six years into it, right? The exploration stages and all these different things. Yes, they, we do run the risk of not having it, but I don't think it's in the policy. The policy should state that they should be first, Guyanese should be given first consideration. And then if we can't, and we can't attain these numbers, then it should be given that it should go maybe regionally and then go out further. Right. So, of course, we know that they, there's some language barriers when it comes to WTO and the word and the different words in terms of preference and consideration. Right. So we I don't think that we're gonna run into any major problem because what it does, I mean, if you look at our neighbors, Trinidad, their policy tells you, tells you plain and straight, you have to set an office in Trinidad, in Port of Spain, in order to be to participate in their industry. If you go look at the Ghanaian policies, if you look at a lot of the countries around the world, it speaks to that. So I don't think that we should take that away. And I don't think that we should not have targets because targets are goals, right? Um, there's an, an, a, a starting point. You're, you have three years to get up to, to the next stage. Um, my, one, of, one of the criticisms that the chamber has is that we need to um, unbundle a lot of the, the, the things that they have there. You have a lot of sectors that are, that are together embracing each other. And we think there should be some separation. We think that the um, definitions should be should be um, there in the policy. You can't just say welding um, because I don't know whether you're welding a gate or you're on, doing underwater welding. Um, I believe that there are a lot of other things in the policy that needs a little more thing. It's the first draft. It's the best looking draft that we've had so far. It's the closest thing, but there's still, it's 
a working thing. We're not an oil. I mean, we just a year now turn an oil producing nation. But I believe that the, the policy, and that's why one of my recommendations was to have the review period maybe annually in at least for the first three to five years rather than every two years. But the regulators have said to us that you must give the industry time to react to this new policy. And that's why they, they place two years. I understand their argument, um, but there's, there's, you can simply bring down maybe some of the fields. And then there are certain things that you can be, I mean, if you look at custom brokerage, you know, I, I think Guyanese are 100% there already. And we're starting at 10, 20%, 40%. You know, um, there are lots of things there that are given and some are taken and there's a balance in it. Um, because we would like to see higher targets and start out for some of these things. As, as I said, we are six years into it. Some of these things are if, we, if this policy was retroactive for six years ago. So I, I don't believe, to answer your question directly, no, I don't believe that we would have too much of a problem. I think we can adjust adequately to this. It's interesting, though, looking at some of the other countries. Trinidad, as you referenced, Timothy, they started to produce uh, oil around 1908. And it's only in the 2000s that they actually came up with a local content policy um, with a framework, which by that time, they should have had a lot more capacity than they did at 1908, which was the beginning for them as it is currently for us now. Um, exactly. Yeah, so um, Marnie, when you sit down with these international oil companies, um, how high of a concern do they have in terms of what framework the country either has in place or is looking to put in place from the standpoint of them asking questions whether or not the policy that is going to be in place could be potentially harmful to their operations. Um, do you get that kind of, 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 of feedback from them? And um, how is Suriname working within that framework at a similar stage of its development like us, trying to find that balance between those concerns and ensuring that benefits maximize to local participants? Okay, um, they have never, um, of course, when you enter a country and you're thinking of spending some time there investing money, you, you look at um, politics, the risks, um, taxes and what have you. And of course, what workforce is there? Because everybody by now knows that it will become an issue at the end of the day. Um, and within um, and in the contract is, is, is very broad. And if you look at, um, there is definitely a, a what's the word? There is, a, there, there is logic. You have the contract. The next thing is you have the policy that is most of the time a bit broad and not very specific. Then the regulations come into place. And at the end of the day, there is legislation um, to, 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 pin, uh, to pencil things down. Um, we, we all, and I've seen that also in this uh, draft, which I also agree is a, is a very good draft. Um, we say we, we want to be prepared and not go into this Dutch disease thing. Because at the end of the day, again, I'm referring to the smallness of these countries is that everybody that now is working in is, is welding or uh, a, a, a carpenter, they would like to go where the big money is. So it, it's a real challenge. It's a real risk as I see it for um, weakening the, the companies that are there and that are important. And we all know when the oil is gone, it's gone. So for I think that one of the things that also needs to be in the local content policies of, of every country is how do you manage that? This, how do you balance it out that we don't end up because we all say we don't want to, we, we don't want to have this resource curse, but what do we actually do about it? Because it's like looking for crabs. Everybody runs to one place. We want to have more business and we want to have more people, which is what we're here for, right? Otherwise, why would we why 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 would we discuss local content? But how do we 
balance out what is existing that we, as, a, as a, a, among others, governments, but also the, the oil companies, because it's not only the local businesses and the government that are important. The, one of the main stakeholders are the IOCs, and it's their, um, I would say it's on them also to not only uh, give lip service and say, yes, we want to have local content, but it's always easy. Oh, we can't find them. What do you do to empower? What do you do uh, do as an uh, 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 international oil company? Um, how do you empower that you are there, not only for the oil, but also to lift societies up? And I think uh, it, it's, it's always quite easy to just put the burden on, on the government or the business society. They have to train, they have to get the, cer the certificates in place. But I would definitely see the IOCs as, um, what do you do? If you say you wanna be in a country for the next 20, 25 years, and you wanna be lifting up, help lift up this society among others through the benefits that they will reap from, from this natural resource. So that these are things that I um, constantly think about as, as you know, being at the very start and I see how things uh, things develop. I don't want the our all our farmers who, who plant rice. I don't want to start importing rice in five or ten years' time. Uh, definitely. And I think agriculture is a major focus here to Indiana, um, particularly ensuring that revenues from oil and gas is plugged into that oil will finish, people will still be eating. Um, we are at the end of our time. I want to um, end with a brief remark from each of you, very short, on your outlook for the Guyana Suriname Basin in the context of what is happening right now. I believe Suriname has about five discoveries they would have made um, so far. Guyana has 18 discoveries, um, experts and, and, and the companies themselves. Um, themselves are now saying that the potential reserves could be double what we know is there, which would be exceeding 18 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Um, what is your outlook for this basin for, for Guyana and Suriname? Natasha? Well, these are certainly exciting times, as I always say, Chris, you know, for us as, as Guyanese, I'm, I'm very excited. Um, as Marnie and, and Timothy noted earlier, as we think about oil and gas and as we think about local content, it must fit into a national framework, into a national policy. We have to ensure that one industry does not draw all of the resources that we have in country. We know that, you know, as the government has a mandate of the diversification of Guyana's economy. And so agriculture has been our basket, mining, manufacturing. How do we move towards more of an industrialized nation? You know, Timothy mentioned the fact that the cost of electricity still remains high to us. So how do we ensure that we bring that down so that we can make our manufacturers more competitive internationally? So we have to really see ourselves as an oil and gas producer, but also as an agriculture economy, as a manufacturing economy. How do we ensure that there is sustainability over the longer term and how do we utilize the oil and gas industry as a driver for success in these other industries. So I'm certainly excited about what the oil and gas industry has to offer and you know, the potential in terms of where it can take Guyana. We can become one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And so I want to see that in my lifetime. Timothy? <laughs> follow order to follow. But definitely, um, I, I, I completely um, echo Natasha's sentiments. I would love to see Guyana, Guyana the Guyana Basin, um, Guyana and Suriname interconnected, even though language separates us and the Quarantine River separates us, I believe that we, we have the... the we have joint a joint set of resources here that can really bring us together. Um, together, we 1.3 million people. Um, we don't need a million businesses. 
right? We need 100,000 really successful businesses. We need, we need to come together, right? Guyana, now I'm speaking on the Guyana's part, Guyana part, we as a people, as a country, have to put, uh, put aside all our differences and realize that we have an opportunity of a lifetime, right? Um, what we do in this time, right, is what will our children will go through in their time. So if we want our children to be worse off than we are, right, we can continue sitting down and, and allowing um, our natural resources to go away and, our, and the opportunities that are in front of us to be taken by other people, right? Um, we have been here, we have battled, we have faced colonialism, independence, socialism, capitalism, um, all sorts of things, you know, we have faced and go gone through and um, good, bad, however, but what it has always come back to is the Guyanese are innovative, resilient, right? We battle through the worst circumstances and always come out on top, even in the darkest moments, right? We can still take a laugh. Um, even though we didn't find El Dorado, we found El Dorado rum, which is the best rum in the world. So we have to definitely look at the things that, that makes the things that brings us together and realize that we are in this together. We have to join our resources because we can't compete if we don't. If we don't come together, we have to put our heads together. To, to our companies have to join, our businesses, our families. It's 750,000 people, right? Almost everybody is auntie and uncle, right? Um, and it really is the time for us to unite for the benefit and the lifting of this nation. Um, and I believe that the local content and national local content policy, in my opinion, is what is needed more than anything else, right? To grow all sectors. Because we see people coming in for agriculture. We see people coming in for construction. We need, see people, those technologies and those things we need to capture. So I don't want to go on too long. I just want to end there and say that we have to unite in order to, to really reap the benefits, right, of all the industry. And to get true local content, we must unite and get everybody involved. Uh, thanks, Timothy. Marnie. Yes, um, I, I could not agree with uh, Timothy more. Um, I, I like the way he, he thinks because I think that um, he is right on spot. If I look at Suriname, uh, I think the, big, the only difference is that we had a military regime, but it's the same thing. Um, um, that's why they call us the, the wild coast. Um, but... but because we have to laugh, eh? otherwise we'll, we'll cry. I always look at Suriname and I say, we had a hundred years of bauxite industry. We know more than our parents. Uh, we have more money than our parents. The world is different than a hundred years. So we cannot use that as excuse anymore. Oh, they did it and, and, we, and we, 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 are the, we are the victims. We have to think local, um, but act global. Otherwise, we will vanish because we're small as it is. Another thing that I, 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 would, um, I would like people to take away is that without effort, things won't happen and because there's not one size fits all. I even tell people Suriname and Guyana is one basin, but it's, there is difference. So um, monitor progress and uh, adjust, refine, your your targets but also be realistic we have to like like timothy said let's uh we don't need a million but we need a hundred thousand very good businesses that will thrive for the next centuries because we know that most probably in suriname and guyana it's the biggest last big big investments 
for crude oil because the the mix the energy mix will 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 slightly change over the course of the next years the world is changing we 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 are there so if you if you look at it our position right now um let's unite let's use a bit of the brains that we have and the resilience that we've always demonstrated and then we will come further and we're never the victim we're always the one that uh through thick and thin good and bad we survive and let's only survive a little better and let's not use the excuse we we can use for those who started for Suriname then 100 years ago the bauxite industry because i always say mistakes we make today because we're going to make mistakes will haunt off haunt us for centuries to come and with that i i really would like to thank you for allowing me to uh, be part of of this discussion because of course who am i i'm 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 um i'm from suriname so it's it's not really my place to to comment or be part of a of a local discussion concerning the policy uh, but i would definitely i've learned i always learn and i've learned a lot i learned a lot uh, of of how things are going in in uh, guyana because of course we have i always say we've 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 read the introduction to oil and gas and uh but guyana, guyana is living the real a story in deep water right now and there's so much we can learn and see uh, not copy but learn from each other uh thank you marnie and and guyana and suriname has and continues to have a close relationship um and i believe that our destiny in many areas are intertwined um i'd like to thank you all for your closing remarks very uplifting forward looking you know i often say to people that um if your if if your thinking is is pessimistic um and that is that is the outlook that you have then that would be the results too that you get um therefore optimism and 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 looking forward and hoping and working towards the best i think is where we all need to be so um thank you all for those those remarks uh, marni dal former director at statsoli hydrocarbon institute Timothy Tucker, member of the Georgetown Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Natasha Daskin Peters, director at the Center for Local Business Development. Um, we do hope to have you all back again. Thank you very much, and thank you out there for watching. Mm -hmm.